Nigeria's military has announced the deaths of Abu Musab al Banawi, the head of West African branch of the Islamic State group. The chief of defense staff, General Nloki Rabo, stated that he is dead and remains dead, not giving additional details. Now, ISWAP has not commented on the claims. It is reported that since then, thousands of Boko Haram fighters have surrendered, both to the military and reportedly to ISWAP. Joining us to discuss this is Dennis Amakri. He's a former assistant director of the Department of State Services, DSS. Thank you very much for joining us, Mr. Amakri. Good evening. Thanks it's, for having me. It's interesting how the chief of uh, army staff uh, or defense staff um, said it. I'd like to quote him directly. He says, I can authoritatively confirm to you that Abdul Abu Musab is dead. As simple as that. He's dead and remains dead. Now, this isn't the first time that we're hearing from the army that a leader of either Boko Haram or a terrorist group has been killed. And then in a few months, we see the same person and we see the same person again and again. So it makes us really wonder uh, if we should hold on to this particular statement by uh, Mr. Rabo, uh, or should we be a bit more critical because there's been a precedence? Uh, well, the precedence was not with this particular person. Uh, that was with Boko Haram. And, uh, you know, Boko Haram, I personally know that uh, they've had uh, a change of leadership and the change had been with the same person answering the same name. You know, they've done that as a propaganda ploy. Uh -huh. But um, until finally, uh, Shekau had to die. Because we were having almost about two or three Shekaus that were claiming to be the leaders. But anyway, in this particular case, Al-Banawi, who is uh, the son of uh, Yusuf, uh, the original founder of Boko Haram, um, had a... Um, I think there was a fight and he died. And, um, of course, he, you know, if the chief of defense staff had come out to say that, yes, he's dead this time, then I think he's dead. And uh, what I want to use in confirming it will be uh, the, um, the reaction of IS, that's Islamic State. <coughs> but me. they seem not to have commented so far. They seem to be silent. Yeah, they've not commented so far. So does that mean does that mean that they does that mean that it is real or does that mean that they're waiting to for a comeback? I mean, you and I cannot tell, can we? Yeah, but um, yeah, we, we cannot tell. Uh, we are waiting because they are also trying to re-strategize. So we wait there. Let, let Let's go on. Now that the <clears throat> army has been able to get you know um, this person. Uh, Everybody's wondering what should be the next line of action. We're hearing that there have been uh, lots, loads of these people surrendering to the army. We know that this has been happening, even though the, those were mostly Boko Haram members and some bandits. But we're hearing that more and more of these people are surrendering. Is this a sign that the war is, being, is going to be won more than it used to be? Uh, now that we hear that it, Boko Haram has been pushed or ISWAP to the fringes, is this a signal that the army is going to be having the upper hand from now on? Um, it is uh, a, a signal that um, something different is coming ahead. Something good, so to say, because um, uh, we, have, uh, have, uh, we have the two heads of the two factions. Uh, Iswap leader is dead. Boko Haram leader is dead. And I think um, if the military strategize very well, this is the last time to make the last push and then get uh, this war over with. Because as long as these two leaders are out of the way, um, I think it's an opportunity for uh, our military to go ahead and do what they have to do. Now, there are, there are questions that have been asked across boards, and I'm talking about for every country that has had to fight or deal with the issue of terrorism. So does killing the head of a terror organization mean that you have diminished their power or that you can put an end to that terrorist group? Or is it a tentacle kind of situation or a hydra-headed monster where you cut one and another grows, you know, from where you cut it? Okay, it's a tentacle kind of situation. 
it's a tentacle type, type of situation in the sense that if a leader of a terrorist group has been killed or died, uh, it weakens the body, but it does not eliminate uh, the whole idea. Uh, that's why till today we have Al-Qaeda, you know, although the leader of Al-Qaeda, uh, Bin Laden, is gone, uh, but we have him. Uh, we have uh, IS, uh -huh. uh, ISIS, that's Islamic State, uh, headed by Baghdadi. And Baghdadi is also dead, but IS remains. Uh -huh. So um, we can also have the leaders of Boko Haram and uh, Iswap die, uh, but um, we will still have that organization. Because remember, this is an ideological war. It's an ideological fight where the people who are fighting this, um, you know, is belief system, is the belief system. But if the leaders are dead, it weakens their processes and management. And then, of course, if the military will go in with more psychological operations in dealing with the hearts and minds of these fighters, there is a possibility that... Uh, we could find an end to it. Of course, we are having um, a lot of people surrendering. I think that's a very good sign, too. Uh, let's, let's talk quickly about banditry. Now, we know that that's been uh, more in the news than the issues of Boko Haram or ISWAP. And the army has told us that the army has successfully, um, you know, limited the operations, I mean, the bandits, to only areas where they're dominant. While that is applaudable, I'm wondering... What do you think can be done to limit the activities of these guys, not just to those areas? Because wherever they're being limited to, the people in those areas are suffering. They are subjected to more and more abductions and more and more cases where you have to pay ransom to get people out of their custody. So um, how do we limit those activities to almost nothing or barely, you know, or bare minimum instead of them still having the upper hand in those areas? I think the military have to redouble its effort by pushing these people out of the country. You know, we have to push them out of the country. Uh, there are many uh, facts to show that a lot of them are foreigners, and then we cannot continue harboring them in our borders. So there is need to push them out of the country. And if they are pushed out of the country, then uh, we don't have the problem, much of that problem. But remember, there are copycats now. There are copycats who are behaving like these bandits. And then you, ha you have them outside Zamfara, Katsina, and uh, of course, Kaduna states. Uh, you know that Kaduna states, all the schools are closed down now. Mm. That means they are very, very active there. So um, outside those three states, we still have them. We have uh, people behaving like bandits all the way in the high expressway in Abuja, all the way down to even Niger State. So um, I think um, re-strategizing, I, uh, you know, I believe that the military is re really strategizing, but there should be a push, a final push in dealing with this particular situation. Mm. Now, killing these men um, is not enough, as we have already discussed, um, you know, in the course of this conversation. But how about looking at the reasons why these groups have been growing in their lips and bounds? Let's not forget, young people are being uh, introduced to these uh, slipper cell groups every single day. Um, and the radicalization process keeps, you know, keeps on, it's a gift that keeps giving, unfortunately. Um, how do we do, what do we do um, to, to really deal with the young people in our society so that they do not find these cars as alluring as they find it. Let's not forget, it's not just in Nigeria, even across, I mean, in, the, in Europe now, they, they're making it a law of sorts that if you join these people online and you find out that you can't do it, you cannot come back into the country because you're, 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 you're termed a terrorist, whether you were um, forced into it or not. But we're seeing a lot of it happen. Even the women are being radicalized. How do we deal? Because we need to deal with the cause so that we avoid the effects. So how do we go about it? Yeah, we definitely need to deal with this because it is festering and then we cannot really allow these things to continue. And uh, if you really want to deal with it, first, you have to look for the fundamental issues. 
the root causes of what we are seeing. What we are seeing right now are just symptoms. You know, they are basic symptoms. And if you don't deal with those root causes, and the root causes are simple, everybody knows them. Unemployment, poverty, you know, on the, the lack of education, uh, all kinds of things that people are suffering. And you find out that people are even crossing the desert to go all the way down to Algeria, Morocco, to cross the uh, ocean there and then drown and die. You know, why are our youths moving out of the country to go and then find for greener pastures? Why can't we do something for them here? You know, with all the monies that we hear have been stolen and recovered, why can't we create something for them? You know, you have to deal with these fundamental issues. If you don't deal with these fundamental issues, just pursuing the Boko Haram or Isua fighters is just the surface. We are scratching it. We have crocro on our hands and we are putting bam on it. Mm. What we need to do is to drink the right medicine that will root it out from the inside. Mm. So I but, think but, it's but, very, but, very but, but that responsibility surely falls on the plate of our government. And I'm not just talking about the federal government. I'm talking about government at all levels. And this is a failure, so. of course, on their part. So yeah. looking at the what we have spoken of now, the fact that government has failed, and looking at how they're dealing with the issue right now, um, does it show that they're ready to put an end to this? Because you see, what we're hearing in the news right now, the biggest headlines are that a certain political party is about to have its Congress. Another political party is having infighting as to where they can zone the... But the thing that's making our headlines is not what the people need. So, again, <laughs> can, are we really ever going to make this a thing of the past, looking at the kinds of people that are leading us? I think this is a very, very golden opportunity for the president, President Muhammad Buhari, to write his name in gold in this country, if he can go ahead and take care of this situation. Because, you see, the politicians are back to their game. And then they believe that they, you know, come 2023, they are going to go ahead and uh, rig themselves back into government. They don't care. The other day I was seeing uh, um, a video where somebody of a particular party was giving out cash, was giving out money to people who are standing in line. Now you are doing this uh, with the hope that when the election come, you will just bribe your way through or you rig your way through and then become the leader again of a country that has continued to suffer. Mm. So it is very, very important. We have to face this. And the president have that opportunity, like I said, to do it because it is out of his hands now. The politicians are gone. They are gone. They have they've left him to go and do what they want to do. But he can arrest this situation because I don't see even elections taking place in 2023 if these conditions continue to exist. Um, I'm just curious because... The president has barely two years to be in office, and he's had six years to effect a change. He did not. What's the guarantee that he's even going to be bothered when he's on his way out? He's ha he has his back facing us. You might be surprised if the president comes out and makes certain announcements, certain announcements, it will change things overnight. You know, remember, he's the president. Many things that many people don't know is that the president of a country not only Nigeria, has tremendous powers. And the one in Nigeria has mighty powers. You know, so if he decides, if he has the political will to say that this is not going to continue and I'm going to change this country, turn it around, he can. He can. Because all the forces of security, all the forces of law enforcement are in his hands to use. So it means this is a choice that the president has and he would choose not to or he would choose to. So it means that it lies within his purview.
but he has chosen yes, not to do this in six is. years that he's been in office. And then one day, by the stroke of luck, or maybe an angel from heaven would touch the president's heart, and then, boom, he would do it. Because that's what, that's, what, that's what I think that you're saying. Not necessarily. It's not a spiritual. <laughs> but that's what I think you're saying. Finally, um, we all know that the Sahel region of Africa is experiencing gun running. We're seeing all of these cases of terrorism. Um, Senegal, uh, I mean, all of those countries, they seem to be having their fair share. But they, they all have homegrown methods of dealing with this issue, and they seem to be having an upper hand, except a few countries that also have issues with, you know, governance and, and, and the likes of it. Uh, I'm wondering, because our president is seemingly, uh, used to be, I, I think he still is the head of ECOWAS, um, and he's always sending an envoy to these countries. You know, they have these conversations and they have these meetings. Why is it so difficult for us to also see what these people are doing, those who are winning this war, to adopt it and also have a homegrown way of dealing with this issue? Because it seems like we're being dragged in several directions. I personally don't believe that any of the other countries are winning this war because they are all in the same basket right now. Because when you look at it, look from Mali all the way down to Cameroon, it's the same thing, you know? Remember, there was a coup in Mali. And, of course, ECOWAS wanted uh, the people in Mali uh, to hand over to a democratic government. They have not done it till today. Mm -hmm. Guinea has a coup. And then, of course, they wanted ECOWAS and then, of course, um, African Union wanted them to do that, the same thing. They have not done it till today. Chad is under military regime right now. Although they say that military regimes are very, very unpopular, but these countries have stuck to it. And of course, ECOWAS will not be able to change it. And for many reasons, you know, you find out that um, uh, ECOWAS, number one, finance. They cannot finance a standing army. When we went to ECOMOG, it was Nigeria that went there to go and uh, flush out the rebels. Hmm. And there was success. But right now, Nigeria has its own problems at home. You know, so it will not leave its problem and start going to solve another man's problem. So the problem continues. Hmm. The president was very worried when Mali was taken over by the military. He sent the former president there twice. And then, of course, they said no. And they continue to hold on to power. So it is dangerous because when these things start happening, other countries are also looking at it because the fundamental problem they all have are the problems of poverty, lack of education, um, all kinds of bad health, no health care, and all those kind of things that worry all of them. Yeah. So we have to be very, very careful when we're dealing with this because if you look at the, at, the, at, the, at the long run, these are things that are, these are bigger threats that are facing the whole Sahel region, you know, and um, we have to be careful. All right. Well, uh, Dennis Macri is former Deputy Director, uh, Assistant Director of the Department of State Services, and we want to appreciate you for being part of this, the conversation. Thank you very much for having me. All right. Well, thank you all for staying with us. We'll uh, bring you quickly the highlights of this week and all the interesting conversations we have had from Monday up until yesterday. But before then, I'd like to say thank you, and I hope you have a great weekend. I am Mary Annacle. when they get most of these armed robbers and these criminals, they will parade them in the public, parade them in the public, they will ask these criminals uh, to uh, you know, demonstrate how they carry out their criminal activities. That is an erroneous uh, process by the policing system. So that was where kidnap took the boom. The kidnap market uh, took the boom because the risk implication uh, in kidnapping very high is very uh, low compared to the risk implication in robbery. So members of this political class, I have sold their souls to, to greed and 
ferocious accumulation. So I'm sitting there thinking, you know what? We can write the constitution as much as we write the constitution as much as we want, but if these people, the politicals that we have now, are those who will work the constitution, they will always find a way of bastardizing it. You'll be shocked if one goes into itemizing some of the laws we have in this country that have been made so functionally, so functionally uh, useless because of the integrity of the Nigerian political class at making any form of any form of legislation or any form of rule nonsensical when it comes to you know perverting it. The current commissioner of police in Lagos State, Mr. Otomos, I hope I got the pronunciation right. Yes. Has a very unadmirable history of disregarding the rule of law. The man seems disconnected from democracy. He cannot appreciate why citizens should express themselves. He cannot understand why Nigerians should be aggrieved, why Lagosians should come out to express their opinion on issues of concern. And he has consistently over time clamped down on peaceful protesters, assaulted journalists, led invasion of protest venues, peaceful protest venues, and he continues to serve the corrupt elite without any regard for human rights, without any regard for democracy, without any regard to his statutory responsibilities. But to your question, we need to say clearly and emphatically, there is nothing under the Constitution, there is nothing under the Police Act of 2020, there is nothing under the laws of Lagos State or any other law for that matter in this country that empowers the police to detect when, where, or for what reason citizens should gather peacefully and express themselves. So, talking of what uh, Mogali talked about, the merging of six political parties, there are a few questions we are going to ask ourselves. Is it ideated just to rest power? Are we talking, is it phallocentric or altruistic reason? Do we have analogousness of ideologies? Because even if you met and eventually you succeed, which is actually a tall order, but if you met and eventually you succeed, at the end of the day, we'll still be back to where we are today, or even worse. But speaking of success first, let us also not forget, nothing tried, nothing gained. That is one. Two, I think they are also exploiting the uh, infamy of the present administration. And also don't forget that these measures we are talking about, we are only seeing the likes of Bogalo and Co. These are parties that will be populated by a lot of disgruntled people in the PDP and in the APC.